Moments of Triumph 2020 are here, is here, and with it brought the revitalization of previously outdated raids, Leviathan, Eater of Worlds, Spire of Stars, Scourge of the Past, and Crown of Sorrows. Not only that, but these raids have no weekly loot lockouts anymore, at least on the main encounters, so that means you're able to farm raid quality loot from these raids an unlimited amount of times for the next two months. That means you can farm for Anarchy and Taraba from Scourge and Crown as much as you want. Two guns I absolutely think you're going to want to grab before the raids go away. That means you can farm for high stat roll armor, although the mod slot in those pieces of armor are still locked to the season in which that particular raid came out. So, for example, Crown of Sorrow armor is locked to Season of Opulence, which means you can only use Season 7 and Season 8 mods in it. All armor from all raids have had their power caps increased to 1360, which means that gear will last another year, although again, you will not be able to use newer mods in those slots. This also means that people are jumping back into the old raids, and I've gotten several requests for refreshers for those raids, so that's what we're going to do today, a quick refresher of how to do all of the Moments of Triumph raid encounters. This is not going to be a full guide. My full guides are linked in the description if you want more information on those encounters. What you're about to watch are highly condensed versions of my guides. They are basically only going to explain what to do in each fight and not really talk about why you do certain things or in-depth mechanic explanations or anything like that. This is so I can keep the video short because I already wrote this and it was over 30 minutes long and y'all ain't gonna watch that. Let's start with Leviathan normal mode. I will be doing only normal mode explanations for all of the raids. For the baths, split your team into groups of three. One group, you'll have two people stand on the two plates on the left, and then the other group, two on the right for a total of four plates, or you can do it to top to bottom, whichever way you want to do it, while the third player in each team will grab the buff from the middle. The buff, called Psionic Protection, will slowly tick down when you're in a pool, and if it runs out, you'll take damage while you stand in any pool. When you start the fight, the middle player, player 3, while already buffed, should go to one of their teammates, player 1, and replace them at their plate. Player 1 will go to the middle of the room to refresh their buff and go to player 2 to replace them. Player 2 will go to the middle, buff, and replace 3, and so on. You'll need to kill some adds that spawn in along with a gladiator that shows up every once in a while. The other team will also be doing this exact same thing. You must all do this until all four chains by the four plates go all the way down, which will be signaled by a gong sound. At that point, all players should go to the middle plate in the middle room and destroy the purple canisters in said room. Grenade launchers, rockets, supers, all of these work here. For the beasts, four people will grab the spores in the lower section, while two people hold crystals in the upper section. The crystal holders will guide the spores to lit up spore nodes around the arena. There are eight in total, four left and four right, and will light up two at a time. You need to be stealthy though, you cannot be detected by the beasts, otherwise you need to start over. When as many players as possible go to a lit up node, the crystal player must shoot the node in order to get a buff. The crystal player must stand in a beam of light in order to use the crystal. If all four players were at the spore, you should have empowered spores buffed up to 12 stacks. More experienced groups can kill the six beasts with only this many stacks, but less experienced groups should grab an additional one or two spores for safety, bring your buff up to 24 or 36. When you are buffed enough, or when time runs out, find the beasts and kill them. A sword's gonna work really well, grenade launchers, shotgun, almost anything works if your stacks are high enough. If you're not able to kill all of the beasts, you need to go back to the safety room where you started the fight. For the gauntlet, split your team into groups of three, one runner and two non-runners. After killing a bunch of adds, two orbs are going to appear, one on the cup side and one on the beast side. This is where your groups are going to be. The runner will pick up this orb and be teleported into the gauntlet, where they must run the, the gauntlet. Every quarter of the track, the runner will be blocked. 
in order to pass through, the non-runner team needs to be standing on the plate of where the runner is being blocked. If you're standing on the plate, then the runner will see one of the nine holes light up. The runner will call out the row of the hole that is lit up. The non-runners will shoot the opposite arrows, so if top is called, shoot middle and bottom arrows. If successful, the runner can continue. If not, the runner is likely to die unless you unblock the next wall quickly. Regardless, the non-runners will need to punch a scion that spawns in front of them after that event happens, then they should rotate clockwise to the next plate. Run the gauntlet, make it out, and dunk the orb in the middle of the room. After three waves of this, everyone should go to the middle, grab an orb, and run the gauntlet, alternating who picks up orbs in order to stay alive. No specific guns are needed here. For Callus, split your team into three and three. More advanced teams can do two and four for reasons I will explain. After you start the fight and fight some adds, everyone will be teleported to the Shadow Realm. Three orbs in front of you allow three players to go back into the throne room. Those in the Shadow Realm will see Callus's forehead light up with a symbol and should call them out. The people in the throne room should kill the scion of the symbol not called out. This will progress the Shadow Realm team forward without killing them. Shadow Realm players should kill all scions as well. After four rounds of this, Shadow Realm players will shoot at dozens of skulls coming out of Callus' mouth. The more you shoot, the more damage you will deal to Callus when you do the damage phase. More advanced teams will leave four in the Shadow Realm in order to shoot more skulls. The Throne Room team will need to remove Callus' shield in order to bring the Shadow team back in. Wait until your screen is about to completely turn white for maximum time for the Shadow Realm people. When the team is whole again, jump on a plate together to start damage. Weapons to use here include grenade launchers, snipers if you can manage to see through all the explosions, xenophage, any other long distance weapon, machine gun if you really don't have anything. You should be able to one cycle this as long as your buff stack is high enough. Moving to Eater of Worlds, we're just going to start with Argos Part 1. The jumping puzzle, just keep moving forward on the platforms and take it a little seriously unless you want to be here for a half hour. Argos Part 1 is where you need to remove the shield around Argos. Elemental Mines will appear in groups of three of varying elements, Solar, Arc, and Void, on the giant walnut in the center. You need to pick up Vex Craniums around the map bring them to the proper island to charge them, and then shoot the charged cannons at the mines. Shoot mines that spawned first. You need to move fast here as mines that stick around for too long will blow up and kill you. Argos part two is similar to part one. Argos will have three elemental balls floating around itself on one of the three sides. You need to charge the appropriate cannons in order to break its shield. You'll do so by shooting the cannons at the balls at the same time and track them towards the center while you're shooting them. This will break Argos' shield, allowing you to deal damage. Watch out for the giant pyramids that Argos will fling at you. If you get caught at one, you'll have to watch yourself float away into the distance while your teammates ignore you to deal damage. Shoot at trapped players and then ridicule them. Snipers are good here, namely Whisper, Darcy if you don't have that, or any legendary sniper with good perks like Triple Tap and Vorpal, things like that. After a damage phase, you'll get a phase where you need to stop Argos from killing all of you. Six panels on Argos' body will be vulnerable, two on its short arms, two on its head, and two on its back. Destroy two of them via sustained crit damage to stop Argos and repeat the process. You should only need probably about two cycles to kill the boss. Spire of Stars is surprisingly difficult for a lot of players, and I would highly encourage you to watch my original guide if you want more details. In part one, assign four people to the four pillars around the room, and the other two players to the north and south to help with adds. The north player will pass the ball to whoever wants to start. I usually go clockwise. To start the fight, pass the ball to someone, have them jump on their pillar, ride it all the way up, and then throw the ball at the middle giant thing. Another ball will spawn in when the fight starts. The player who receives the ball will hop on their pillar, again ride it all the way up, and then pass the ball to the next pillar player. Step off of your pillar before throwing so that you don't accidentally get debuffed again. 
The ball should be passed around in this way until the shield at the center console is removed. When the shield is removed, the player with the ball should make sure their pillar is at the top and then throw the ball at the middle. The north player should then grab a new ball and throw it to the next person in line and repeat this process two more times. In Valkaur Part 1, you need to destroy three ships by throwing charged orbs at them. Start with four people on plates and two people floating around. Whoever is superior retainer needs to go up the tractor beam in the middle of the room in order to scout the ships. The tractor beam is only activated when all four plates are stepped on. The scout will see one of three symbols over a ship. You must throw a charged ball into the doorway of the symbol called out by the scout in order to arm the weapon. To charge a ball, go to the center platform and look for smoke on one of the three buff plates. You'll be stacking the greed debuff if you do grab this debuff and have a ball on you. To open the doorway, all three of the buttons in the middle of the room must be stepped on at the same time. You'll know you did this right if you get a message to appear saying that a weapon is armed. Then, Superior Retainer needs to grab a ball and then buff it, or debuff it, go up the tractor beam and throw it at the ship. Rinse repeat this two more times to complete the encounter. Valkaur Part 2 is like Part 1, but with even more steps. Split your team into three groups, a group of three people, a group of two, and then a solo. To start the fight, jump up to where Kallus is. You'll have a bunch of ads spawn in, just kill them. After a set amount of time, everyone will become engulfed, which will kill you in 15 seconds. A ball will launch out from one of the four launchers at the front of the room, going to one of the plates. This ball needs to be passed to everyone to avoid having people die to engulfed. After the ball is passed to all players, throw it at the boss in order to progress. Four gladiators will spawn on the four plates. Just kill them, but don't stand on the plates as they spawn in, or you're going to die. You will then repeat the superior retainer scout cycle that you did in the first part, but now you need to do two ships at the same time instead of one. This all works the same way, you just need to manage two of the charges instead of the one. After destroying both ships, you'll need to juggle charges to throw at Callus. This is where the teams of three, two, and one come into play. A charge will be thrown into the arena. This should be picked up by team one and buffed from the middle. When the first player in team one gets to nine greed stacks, they should pass the charge to the next person in their team, passing the ball around back and forth in this manner. Team two will get the next charge, buff it, and pass it back and forth. Team three, the solo player, will grab the third ball and buff it. Kallus will eventually call for the charges via alley-oop by putting his hand in the air. Throw the charges at Kallus. All three must hit, otherwise it will be a failure, and you only have a couple of seconds to do this. If all three of the charges hit, Kaur's shield will drop. Do not stand where Kallus was until he comes back down. The strat here is going to be dropping a well or ward on the boss and going hard with swords. You should be able to one cycle this with swords, well, and some form of a debuff. Look up when swinging the sword for more accurate swings. You can also use ward cliff coil and or grenade launchers. Just make sure you have a well to sit in so you don't die to missiles. When Kaur goes down, he will spit out six charges. Every player should pick up only one of them and throw it at Kaur to end the fight. Scourge of the Past, you're up. The entrance requires you to disable the shield by dropping in four charges to nodes around the map. You will have a map reader, a map reader defender as a backup, and the travel team. You always need someone at the map. The map reader will find where the main target is, the berserker, via a giant red dot on the enemy's head. To kill the Berserker, break the two red panels on its body when its shield goes up. The travel team will kill the Berserker, and two charges will drop out. When a charge is picked up, the map reader will say what number charge they have, which is represented by dots on the player. The Schnell building is location 1, and then going clockwise at each of the cardinal directions are locations 2, 3, and 4. 5 is where the map is, and you want to drop this charge in so that you get more time in this encounter. Charge holders should be escorted to their destinations by one or two people to help clear out enemies. A new Berserker will spawn in shortly after in a new location. Do this four times in order to progress. 
Enjoy the Sparrow encounter. Be sure to hit all of the red lights to get a chance at the secret chest at the end, which can contain fallen mods. Punch both nodes at the start at the same time to start the race, and then at the end to close the door. Insurrection Prime Part 1 is all about removing the shield of Insurrection Prime. Split your team into groups of three. Team 1 will go to the lower level. There are four nodes in the lower level, all represented by a sphere, pyramid, cube, and then all three flashing at the same time. Do not hit that one. Don't hit the one that is deep red flashing all the symbols, or you will all die. Each player should punch a node to get a buff. The outside team will kill a servitor after all nodes are punched, except for the crazy one, to reset them. The downstairs team will look for the same symbol that they just punched and punch it again to get two stacks. The outside team will kill another servitor to let the downstairs team escape. The three lower level players will now dunk their charges into the tank consoles in the north, southeast, and southwest nodes, aka node number one, two, and three in that order, which is important for the next fight. After dunking your charge, you will get a tank. Use the tank to blow up the shield of Insurrection Prime. Time your burst missiles together for bonus damage. Keep driving around to avoid missiles. Your tank is only going to last about 35 seconds, so you need all the time that you can get. Repeat until dead. Insurrection Prime Part 2 requires you to shoot it with a tank shot after removing its shields. Try to remove its shields via the six glowing panels on its body as soon as possible. The map reader role is back and must tell players where to go kill the highlighted berserker target. When the highlighted berserker is killed, it will drop two charges. The map reader will tell the people who pick up the charges which nodes they need to go to in order to dunk their charges without dying. Repeat this again for two more charges for a total of four, which is how many you need to get a tank to spawn. Wait for the boss to get into a good spot facing forward with a big space so that you can spread out. When the boss is disabled, after a short time, you will get a buff of a varying type, either continuous, angular, or parallel. Those with the same buff should stack up together for a triple damage bonus. My team uses CAP, or CAP, to stand in predetermined spots. A is right under the boss, with C to the southwest and P to the southeast, making a triangle shape. Be sure to give yourselves plenty of space to spread out, otherwise you will tether to each other, and that is very bad. If you think you're going to be too close to each other, you're probably too close. Give yourselves some room. The buff will change after a short time, so be ready to move to the new location if needed. Whisper of the Worm is yet again a strong play, followed by Darcy and any other well-rolled legendary sniper rifles. Repeat this process until dead. You should probably only need about two phases. Finally, Crown of Sorrow's intro encounter is pretty slow. Split your team into groups of two, left, center, and right. Within those groups of two, one person will be a buffer at the start of the fight. To start the fight, the buff players should all stand in the green circle. There should be three buff players. Buffed targets can only kill certain enemies, and same for non-buffed. Kill targets as they spawn in. The faster you kill them, the faster this fight will go, and trust me, you want this to be fast. Do not leave anything alive at all. After a short time, three crystals will spawn on the left, middle, and right sides of the room in random spots. Destroy them by having a buff and non-buffed player shoot them. After all crystals are destroyed, head to the center of the room where the buff switcher ball is, aka the witch's vessel. Everyone stands close to it and shoots it in order to rotate the buffs to new players. You need to do this in order to not die to Witch's Blessing. Go back to your sides and repeat this a whopping seven more times until all four lights are lit up across the room. If all buffed players ever die, the buff pool respawns by the rally flag. For Galron Part 1, split into groups of two for each segment of the room. The buff from the entrance will start in a random spot. One of the three sections will have the deception in their section. Just run away from it for the entire time. Kill adds until you get an ogre to spawn, and then kill the ogre. The witch's vessel to the right of your section will activate after all adds are killed, provided you started with the buff. For the first cycle of buffs, both players from the first side and one from the second side should get their buffs switched. So now you have one buffed in two different sections. 
continue to kill adds until the next vessel pops open, which is after the ogre is killed. Everyone should pile into this one so that you have four buffs. These buffs are needed to break the deception's shield by meleeing the deception along with a non-buffed player at the same time. If you stand too close to the deception when you have the buff, when the shield is broken, you will lose your buff. So stay away if it is not your turn. Go to town on the deception with swords, just button mash away. For Galeron Part 2, you'll stay split into those same groups. Buff by the rally flag to begin the fight, one buff per section. Kill adds and rotate your buff as needed. Crystals will spawn in a clockwise pattern around the room every so often. Be sure to kill them the same way you did at the start of the raid, one buffed and one non-buffed shooting or hitting it. If you get an ogre, just kill it and keep waiting for a deception to spawn. If you get the deception to spawn, lure it out into the middle of your section and then stun it by having both a buffed and non-buffed player melee attack it, removing its shield. When Galron's hand turns green after an attack, shoot the hand to have it slam down a sword on the deception, hopefully killing it. Make sure the deception is in the middle of the room and not right next to the boss, otherwise the sword attack will miss. Also make sure to grab a new buff by having a non-buffed player in the Witch's Vessel Circle and having that player and a buffed player shoot the vessel at the same time. The buffed player should be outside of the Vessel Circle. After three deceptions are killed, Galron will start to raise its hands in all sections of the room. Shoot its hands to stop this attack, then shoot Galron in the face. Two of the Galrons will be fake and one will be real. After finding the real Galron, swap your buffs, head over to the real one, and go to town on Galron's face with damage. Believe it or not, Legend of Acrius, gonna be a beast here, set up right next to the boss if you have it. Otherwise, Mountaintop and Anarchy is gonna work really well, otherwise grenade launchers and snipers will do fine. Repeat until dead. I really hope this helped. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you next time.